Hello, Loyola's in the house. Um, this is exciting, I'm really very touched. I'm personally very, very moved by having been invited here tonight. And it means a great deal to also be working here this evening with two such wonderful colleagues as Down Cliff. It's a, it's a wonderful moment and it's wonderful to see so many faces that I recognized from my classrooms all those years ago. Um, I only hope I can lend something of meaning and consequence to the mosaic of ideas we're gonna talk about this evening because this has really truly been my intellectual home for 40 years. When I was a 17 year old and I first walked onto this campus in the fall of 1980, I wanted to be a foreign war correspondent, right? There I am in all my flash dance glory. Um, <laughs> I hope I can bring something here that answers this notion of what is generation, what's the future? Um, as the first speaker here tonight, I'm talking about something that we all love and can relate to, our educations. Um, in the quantum light of the massive, massive student debt crisis, it's always in the public square of opinion. We debate about it, there's scholarship on the subject, but it's always presented in quantifiable and economic terms. We talk about the enormity of the tuition increases. We discuss the weight of the burden of debt in every imaginable age group. We talk about GDP indicators and long-term ROI. I'm not gonna talk about any of that tonight, and that may surprise you. What I wanna do is take us back in time, not to the School of Athens, but I do wanna take us back to think for a moment about why we teach and what we teach and how we teach. Um, and how we created the conditions that have created the challenges that higher education faces today. Um, I think we have to look to the past to understand the present if we aspire to create a future for the next generation of Loyola alumni. For a bit of perspective, I'm a child of the 20th century by fortune, an American by birth, and a Greek by blood. I'm the first in my family to go to university, and my father, true story, made me go to Loyola because it was the school with all the priests. <laughs> I'm one of the lucky ones. I think all of us in this room are. We are part of a very, very small fraternity of the global population that hold a university degree. We number less than last 7%. And my absolute bedrock in my life has been my education, and nothing in my professional life has given me as much pleasure as working with my students. So tonight I'd like to elevate their voices beyond the public square of riotous and angry protests because they're much, much more complicated than that. And we can't ignore their voices anymore, whether in Beirut or Barcelona, Chile or Hong Kong or this remarkable young girl. They're fighting for a future, a future. And I deeply believe that long-term revival and innovation, but as importantly, civic participation and social cohesion will arise from how we reform education. There are three billion reasons that we should care because no one in this room will dispute that the lifeblood of young people represents our collective future. And they've inherited an absolute extraordinary alchemy of challenges that deserve serious people to design serious solutions to serious challenges. And they're looking to us, all of us, whether in academia or in business, to help cultivate the solutions. And they're also part of the proverbial 99%. If the 20th century taught us anything, it was that renewal and innovation draws from the middle class, from the people who do the living and working and dying, who build dreams and homes and better futures, continue traditions and create new ones. But somewhere along the way, and for countless reasons, the complexities of our 30-year-old global economy have created profound imbalances in our world. Our moral failings and the triumph of markets and market economics have entered spheres of life where they may not necessarily belong. And we haven't sat back and rigorously considered the moral meaning and consequence of confusing the goods of life with the good life. Because this crisis of finance has also morphed into a crisis of confidence impacting all civic institutions, including the academy. And I believe it's our responsibility as educators to understand the culture and reflect the zeitgeist of the times we teach in. Because if we reveal ourselves through the experiences we most cherish, I want you to harness the signs of memory and think back to your days as a student. Reflect on the books that inspired you or the teachers that awakened your imaginations. And as you do that, I hope you'll indulge me because I'd like to read passages from a now very famous letter 
written by a father to his son's teacher, which in part reads, he will have to learn, I know, that not all men are just or true, but teach him that for every scoundrel, there's a hero, and for every selfish politician, a dedicated leader. Let him learn early the wonder of books and the secret of quiet laughter. Grant him the time to ponder internal mysteries and teach him it's more honorable to fail than cheat. Teach him to have faith in his ideas, to listen to all men, but to filter all he hears through a screen of truth. Let him have the courage to be impatient. Let him have the patience to be brave. And teach him always to have sublime faith in himself, because then he'll have sublime faith in mankind. Now, I read this letter not because I do believe that Lincoln was the grooviest of American presidents, but because he believed that education was the single most important element of our civic life. And I want you to imagine, and depending where you're sitting in the room right now, you're seeing a very different perspective of this famous 1976 lithograph by Salvador Dali entitled Lincoln and Dali Vision. But imagine the country that Lincoln presided over, divided, the Civil War, enormous and controversial military obligations, pressing demands for educated workers at a time when only a privileged few attended elite private institutions, technology advances, shifting economic priorities, population and urbanization shifts demanding new infrastructure. These characteristics are peculiarly modern, but they absolutely formed the backdrop against which America's great public universities were built as a way of extending higher education to the working class and fundamentally and forever transforming America. Because in July of 1862, amidst the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln ratified the Merrill Land Grant Act, an immortal moment in the history of higher ed in America, and I would argue the world, because it reserved millions of acres of federal land for the creation of our great public universities, schools that would teach and research the agricultural and mechanical arts and sciences of the day. Its legacy, of course, is that these institutions express the great American tradition, and this is the important part, that merit and not money would be the great equalizer for opportunity, thus implementing both Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson's meritocratic ambition that education would serve to create an aristocracy of achievement arising from a democracy of opportunity. Indeed, in the late 19th century, education was traumatically reformed to reflect the contemporary needs of automation, mass production, and Adam Smith's pin factory, where literalists and order takers drove the engine of cultural and economic growth. And while the Land Grant Act was simple in design, it was born of a very, very, very complicated era, believe it or not, even more complex than our own time, and I know that's hard to believe. The Union was ultimately saved, and America evolved to become a formidable superpower stemming in part from the implementation of these profound and comprehensive educational changes. But when thrashed against 21st century realities, the pressures of our fourth industrial revolution, the needs of education extend far beyond just memorizing facts and learning specific redundant skills. As Paul Romer explains, that's the purpose of an education, to design better societies and better widgets. And in the digital frontier that we all inhabit, possibilities don't merely add up, they multiply. Today, we create value not by following commands and being told what to do, and there is no syllabus for life. The work of the future hinges on off-the-grid thinking on a universal grid, and we need education to create fewer order takers and more inventors, where we create a new understanding of what knowledge means by connecting students and engaging them in real-world problems, addressing issues important to humanity, and asking questions that matter. And I'm not just saying this because I'm addressing a room of Loyola alum as a Loyola alum, but I think we do a pretty damn good job of that at luc.edu. <laughs> the widespread contemporary assumption that the land-grant schools were simply advanced vocational institutions is misleading. This famous painting of Lincoln with his axe reading Socrates is one of those, even though Socrates wrote nothing. It was Plato, his boy that scribed everything. Yes, they offered cutting edge science and technical research, but they cultivated a curriculum that combined abstract and applied knowledge. The act was a thoughtfully engineered fusion of what sadly, in many circles today, we consider paradoxical, the merging of practical and ideal, of business and art, of capitalism and democracy. It's a view echoed in the ambitions of the great social historian Max Weber, who argued that scholarship should be our vocation. 
educational reconstruction is and always will be the fundamental underpinnings of society's advances. And I often wonder how would Lincoln feel if there was a Harvard business case devoted to his case study? Now, this is the part that I believe it begins to shed light on how far we've moved from that original creation. While the debate over the meaning and purpose of higher education in the United States has been a long one, the first neoliberal blueprint was an essay in 1955 penned by economist Milton Friedman entitled Government in Education, where Friedman argued that market, com market, com excuse me, market competition in education would maximize efficiencies and innovation. And it was Friedman's neoliberal discourse that has since determined the agendas of governments in education and gradually been institutionalized over time. That essay was quickly followed in 1971 by future Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell's confidential and very influential memo to the US Chamber of Commerce Education Committee, where he cautioned against the rising assault on the enterprise system among the leftists on America's college campuses in the 60s. And he recommended a series of steps be taken, including the creation of the earliest think tanks, including the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, and the Accuracy in Academia to help shift the public debate. The experiment with Friedman and Powell's theses was never more violent than in the 60s student protest movements of California and the corresponding slogan that behind every fee hike in tuition, a line of riot cops, which so enraged newly elected Governor Ronald Reagan that in February of 1967, he enacted sweeping legislation that promised to cut state funding for higher education on the grounds that, quote, there are certain intellectual luxuries that perhaps we can do without. Taxpayers should not be subsidizing intellectual curiosity. And Reagan's strategy worked. It crystallized what has since become conventional wisdom about college. And he was only able to do this by shifting the public debate over the meaning and purpose of higher education in America at a moment when he could have argued it was a patriotic responsibility at the height of the Cold War. But instead, he transformed a public good into a costly commodity. In fact, in the early 1970s, three quarters of Americans freshmen said it was essential to them to develop a meaningful philosophy of life. Only about a third felt the same about being financially well off. Those numbers and fractions have been completely reversed and no one, no one in this room can be misguided enough to believe or not understand why when we require young people to make such profound sacrifices, but not without taking a toll on their mental health. Transforming higher ed is tantamount to social transformation. And the world's crying out for renewal and reconstruction from civic institutions and universities play a vital role in times of crisis because we think for the long term, we work with less bias, and we are devoted to improving the lives of the men and women and communities that we serve. The great universities in their origin didn't only teach the practical and vocational subjects, but devoted attention and experimentation to curriculum that led to a deeper and more meaningful appreciation of life, something spawned by the ancients in Pedia, a wonderful concept Aristotle ascribed. And yet today, students arrive on college campuses mired in this conundrum of narrow realities, and we in education, whether alum or educator alike, need to remind them of why they stepped on a college campus. Because they believe and have been conditioned to believe that the most important choice they make is that of career. And that a fulfilling life is only possible through the prism of career, but that's extraordinary at a moment when these young men and women are looking at triple digit birthdays and careers that could be 75 years long and have 12 to 15 shifts in industry, we're asking them to make decisions and feeding them through the grist for this mill of competition that kills their spirit and quite frankly, in many cases, gets them out of school less creative than when they first came into it. There's all kinds of shining examples of how academia is shifting to reflect these, whether it's the Earth Institute at Columbia or the MIT, the grandfather, right, of the open courseware world, producing the most extraordinary bionic prosthetics through support of public-private partnerships, the work that's coming out of the University of Tokyo. But the one that we should all be really super excited about is this one. 
And I'm not just saying it because it's our house. I see these kids across the street from Schreiber, and it feeds my spirit. And we should all be so thrilled by what came out. I mean, when I saw Kevin Stevens' name in the first sentence, my heart skipped a beat. We should all be super proud of this, because this is what we need. We need the creativity to infuse steam in STEM degrees. Not only to inspire the next great meta-thinking that will launch the next jobs or the next gates, but the next Chomsky, Galileo, or Curie. Our spirits are fueled by great scientific adventures and advances to be sure, but maybe more so by the humanist expressionism that will outlive the ages. And I know there are some of you in here that are looking at me as a romantic idealist, and there's no challenge, there's no denying this will be hard, but the stuff in life worth chasing often is. I believe it's our responsibility as educators at a values-based school devoted to the business of social justice to stoke the imaginations of the next generation, not only to be thinkers, but to be tinkerers, to be pragmatists and dreamers. My own daughter's in the audience today, and I hope you'll indulge me if I tear up a little bit, but I think in our quest as parents, we often fail to give our children what we did have in our quest to give them what we did have, and it's a fighting chance. And I want to bring the game back to them so that in the quantum light, we are ultimately all connected in this odyssey called education. So years from now, surrounded by my children and are my children's children, I can tell them that we rose and that we didn't fail because ultimately we kept students curious and made sure that our education system would do the same. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.